you are the God that can make a way when there seems to be no way, Lord God. I thank you, Lord. I praise you, Father, even tonight, Lord God. Father God, that there's no one like you, Father God. I thank you that we can walk in that confidence, Lord God. Now, Father God, the victory is already ours, Lord God. I just thank you that even tonight, Lord God, that if we open our mouth wide, Lord God, if we open our mouth and speak life, Lord God, into the dead things, Lord God, that they will come to life, Lord God, that that new bones, Lord God, will live again, Lord God. I just thank you, Father God, even tonight for what you're doing, Lord God, in this place, Lord, even in our midst, even now, Lord God. I thank you that you are awakening us spiritually, Lord God, each and every one of us, Lord God, to the next level, Lord God, Father, that you are propelling us forward, Lord God, in you, Lord. I just thank you even tonight, Lord God, for what you're doing, Lord God. I thank you for your presence, Lord God. I thank you for your anointing in this place, Father God. We praise you tonight, Lord God. We magnify your name, Lord God. You're worthy, Lord. You're worthy, Father. There's no one like you, Father. We magnify your name, Lord God. You're such a good, good God, Father God. It has nothing to do with us, Lord. It has everything to do with you, Lord God. And with who you are, Lord God. Thank you for who you are to each and every one of us, Lord. Thank you for hand-picking each, each individual, Lord God, as your own, Lord God. That you picked us even before, Lord God, we said yes, Lord God. That you have called us even here tonight, Lord God. That we're not here by accident, Lord God. That we are here for a purpose, Lord God. And a plan, Father, that you have for each and every one of our lives, Lord God. And Father, today we say yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, have your way, Lord. Have your way in each and every one of us, Lord. We praise you, Lord God. We thank you, Lord. We magnify your name, Lord. Thank you for who you are, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We magnify you tonight, Lord. You're worthy, Lord. You're worthy, Lord. You're so good, Lord. You're so good. You're such a good, good God, Lord. You're such a good, good Father, Father. Thank you that you love us unconditionally, Lord God. That even when we're not faithful, Lord, you are, Lord. You're so good, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We praise your name tonight, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm just going to ask you to do a prophetic act right now. Just breathe in the goodness of the Lord. And he is so good. Just take that deep breath because he is the breath of life. He will give you the strength that you need even for tonight. And even to continue going, not to give up. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your refreshing, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We praise you tonight. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. We praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. You're worthy, Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. You may be seated. I'm just going to welcome Catalina. So, I just want to um, welcome our first time guests and tell you thank you for joining tonight and I want to let you know we are so happy to see you and you might think like really are you really happy to see me we are so happy to see you I want you to know that Monday through Friday we I we the people in the church we wake up at 5.30 in the morning just to pray for you. So when we, we, we pray that when you walk through the doors that immediately your life would be touched and, and you would have an encounter with God. So we pray for you this night. It's not by accident that you're here and we're happy that you're here because this is going to be a transforming, life-changing night. Amen? Amen? So I would like to welcome. I have gift cards for you for Kevin. Welcome and thank you for coming. We prayed for you. <laughs> um, Becky. <laughs> Welcome. And for Crystal. So I hope you guys came with a heart of expectancy because.
because my God answers prayers. Amen. 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 All right, so we're going to go ahead and um, take up our tithes and offering. On the screen, you'll find our ways to, our different ways to give. You can give online at our website, or you can text the dollar amount to 84321, or you can um, download our Church Center app, and on there you can go ahead and just click Give, and then you can put in all your information. And if you, you if you have cash or um, check, you can raise your hand for an envelope, and one of our ushers will come around and give you an envelope, and you can give that way as well. Um, Robert will go ahead and do that now if you need an envelope. And while he's doing that, I just wanted to read Luke 6, 38. It says, Give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the, the measure you use, it will be measured to you. So one of the main reasons people preach about giving, giving your tithe and offering, is so that God can bless you back. It's clear as day, it's in the word. If you give, you will receive. That's how the kingdom of God works. The more you give, the more you will receive. You can't out give God, I'm sure you've heard it before. But today, I wanted to take it one step further. Um, I, I teach the kids, and I, I teach the kids it's not an option. The Bible doesn't say if you want to give your tithe and offering, you can. It's not. It's not an option. God says to give. Yes. To give your tithe, it's what's due. It's what's His, right? And as a bonus, He blesses us for our obedience. Come on. So today we have an opportunity to give. Right. It's not. It's not um, something that a burden that we have to do. We get to give, and in return, we get to be blessed. How great is the God that we serve? He just doesn't require us to give, and that's it. No, He gives us more than what we can what we can imagine. Yeah. Our, literally, our cups will run over. Yeah. So, if you're in need today, if you're in lack today, I'm gonna tell you something to do something that the world would say no to do. If you need finances, you need blessings today, step out in obedience. God will bless you more than man can ever bless you. Amen? Amen. So let's go ahead and, and pray over our tithes and offering. Lord Jesus, you see every obedient heart, Father, whether it be big or small, Lord Jesus. I pray, Father, even as your word says that you will open up the windows of heaven and pour out so many blessings that we will not have room to contain. Oh, Father, that we would understand what that scripture means, Father. I thank you for that this house will never be in lack, that the houses of every person that gives would overflow, even this week, that they would immediately see the results of the obedience to you, because it's not about the money, it's about their hearts, Lord. And your word says the earth is your footstool. Yes. Father, you own everything, Lord Jesus. And I just pray that you would just open our hearts and our minds to receive in Jesus' name. Yes. Amen. Yes. I'm going to go ahead and invite you to put your attention on the screen as we uh, do our announcements. Welcome to the Citadel. So glad to have you here with us. We would also like to thank those of you who have joined us online. We would like to welcome our first time guests. We're so happy you're here. Please fill out a connect card. Raise your hand if you need one, and one of our greeters will be happy to hand you one. Or scan our QR code on the screen to fill it out from your smartphone. Don't forget to download the Church Center app to keep up to date with upcoming events, giving, and being a part of small groups. Join us for our free service prayer before every service from 6 to 6.30 p.m. in our sanctuary. We encourage everyone to join our early morning prayer. From 5.30 to 6 a.m., we have a time of soaking. From 6 to 6.30 a.m., we pray on behalf of our city, church, and family. To participate, join the early morning prayer small group on the Church Center app to get the Zoom link. Let's agree together in prayer. Are you interested in serving by volunteering? We need your help with media, ushering, greeting, and kids ministry. Sign up sheet is in the back or see Veronica Costa. Sundays, 5 to 6.30 p.m., we have our women's, men's, and kids ministries. 
Women's Ministry, Hearts on Fire with Ana Chavez. Men's Ministry, Kingdom Men with Robert Acosta Sr. And our Kids Ministry, Cadet Edition with Catalina Campos. Come grow with us. We have a young women's group, Girl Time, ages 16 to 35, for a time to hang out, fellowship, and study the women in the Bible. Once a month, see Emily Nico Chao for more details. Mark your calendars, Thursday, June 1st, and Friday, June 2nd. We will be having Bishop Robert Hooks as our guest speaker at 7. Make sure to be here and invite others. We're excited to announce our next prophetic conference, Thursday, September 7th through Saturday, September 9th. Be sure to mark your calendars for more information to come. Can you sing? Can you play an instrument? Would you like to try out for our worship team? If so, see Nancy Acosta for more information. Do you have a desire to learn and worship God with a tambourine? Would you like to join our Unity Tambourine Group? Speak with Gloria Camirano for more information. Woo! Yeah. Guys, it is with great honor and a privilege to introduce, all the way from California, Come on. Pastor Aaron. Well, thankful to be in the house of God tonight. Um, just to reiterate some of those announcements, if you have never sat under the teaching of Bishop Robert Hooks, you need to put it on your calendar. A uh, mighty man of God who I have preached at my church a lot. And um, partly, you know, his nickname is Hitman Hooks. And um, the, the dude is so accurate. So accurate. And uh, he has got a he's got a unique gifting. Uh, he dances a little better than I do. He's got a he got a little better groove. But other than that, uh, I would encourage you to put it on your calendar. Plenty of notice there. Yeah. You can't say I didn't know. Right. And you can't uh, you know some of you are already planning your vacation on that day, so you don't have to come to church. Well, make sure you're here. Uh, thankful to see new faces in the crowd tonight. Uh, if I've never met you before, my name is Aaron. Thank you so much for the introduction. And it is a privilege and honor to be here um, in Tucson, Arizona, where the air is hot and then it rains and then it's hot. And I'm, I'm confused. I'm not sure if I should put the top down on the car or leave it up. I'm either going to get sunburned or drenched. So I just leave it up. And uh, they were so gracious that they... Uh, they signed me up for the manager special at the at the uh, rental car place. And I didn't know what that meant. It was the deal. And so you get whatever the deal is. And so they, they had this little tiny car for me. And I said, that's awesome. I don't know, I'm gonna look like the Incredibles guy in that car. I don't know what you want to give me a smart car. And he said, well, what kind of car you want? I said, I don't know. I said, last time I was here, I got like a Ford Mustang convertible. He goes, oh, well, then you can get that again. I said, oh, great, I'll take it. Yeah. And so um, I'm not going to lie, I've been speeding a couple times. You think that it's so fun just to just <laughs> all the way down, and it's, uh, it's kind of awesome. And so um, that's what we are going to try to do tonight is press on the gas pedal and go uh, straight ahead. I am, um, I'm battling in my mind today to, on what to preach. I have a, I have a sermon that I'd like to preach, um, but I feel like I need to teach tonight. And um, I love to preach. I love to yell and holler and scream and uh, hop over these pews and get to the next person back there and take your head and just shake it for a minute. That's my favorite kind of ministry. Um, but I feel like there needs to be a, uh, just for a couple of minutes, a solid teaching. I feel like there is a, uh, what God is leading me to is that there is some things that's happened in your life and in this church that need to be addressed. And so tonight I want to take just about 15 or 20 minutes and then we're going to flop and we're going to flow in the Holy Ghost. And so uh, some of you might be here tonight saying, that, you know, I'm the you know, the most controversial topic in the church today is speaking in tongues. 
Now this church is full of the Holy Ghost, but you may be visiting here today and be like, I knew it was one of those churches. <laughs> I knew it was one of them crazy churches and they all have that gibberish. Um, more people more people debate church about, are you a tongue-talking church? Are you, do you speak in tongues? Do you flow in the Holy Ghost? More than they care about, do you preach the Bible? Come on. Most people would go to a church that doesn't preach the Bible as long as they don't speak in tongues. They, they care more about that. And, and understand this, the Holy Ghost, we've done a disservice to the Bible. We've said that the, being filled with the Holy Ghost means you speak in tongues. That is not what being filled with the Holy Ghost means. Right. Being filled with the Holy Ghost means that you're a dude with power. Yeah. And out of that power comes a new language. Yeah. And sometimes we get those mixed up and think, well, you know, if I don't speak in tongues, I don't have the Holy Ghost. Well, let me help you understand something. When you receive Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, you receive the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And so you're like, well, I won't say, but I don't do the Holy Ghost thing. Yes, you do. You may not know it, but you do it because they're all the same and they're in you. And so, and, and just to really bend your mind just a little bit, Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. That's what the Bible says. He sent the Holy Spirit to be with you. The Holy Spirit is the one that resides inside of you, not Jesus. But because the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are one, they all kind of reside inside of you. Now that you're totally confused, let's get on a teaching for a second. Amen? Again, if you uh, if you were here last night, thank you for coming back. Uh, for those of you that are new, uh, know what God wants them to do, but because of the hard times in life, they feel like they can't. And today, tonight, whatever time it is out there, hallelujah, I want to help encourage you that there's a God that believes in you. There's a God yes. that is for you. There's yes. a God that is fighting for you. And tonight, I want to um, I want to help you understand how to get to those points. Now, last night, if you weren't here last night, we talked about the places of desperation, of revelation, of anticipation, and of demonstration. We talked about the four levels of breakthrough in our lives. But how many of you know you can have breakthrough one day and have a breakup the next day? Anybody ever had that happen? You have the best day of your life and you're like, yeah, I didn't feel like it's moving forward. And then everything crumbles the next day. Well, how do we continue to move forward as children of the king? How do we continue to move forward as godly men and women when we don't have a world that we live in that's perfect? Maybe you have a perfect world, but the rest of us, we live in an imperfect world. And the rest of us have to struggle at about every red light when somebody cuts you off, when somebody stops too soon, when somebody's going too slow. Uh, maybe it's just me and this Mustang, but I feel like everybody in town is driving too slow. But this thing does incredible swerves. It just goes in and out of the lanes, and uh, I haven't got a ticket yet. But uh, if I do, I'll use one of your names and say, I, I just moved here, this is my name, and uh, see, if, see if they believe it. Uh, turn in your Bibles to Philippians. And while you're there, while you're turning there, uh, last night I gave you four things to write down. Tonight I'm going to give you three things to write down. Now I would encourage you to, um, in, in, in my church back home, I preach this sermon every year. You say, wow, pastor, can't you come up with any new material? Yes, I can. But I preach it. I preach it every year. Because I need people to, to get it back in their minds of how we make it through another year. And maybe this isn't the beginning of the year, but I believe it's the beginning of a new season for this church. Yeah. I believe that you've walked around and, and, and as the children of Israel have wandered and been in a place, I believe that you are close to the place of crossing over. Yeah. I believe that you are close to the promised land. And I believe that you're walking into a new season. And as you as this church... As, and if this is not your home church, if you're just visiting, you're here tonight because God brought you here. The Holy Spirit led you here because you are in a place, in a season of a new season that God is walking you in to a new thing. And so tonight, I want you to write down these three things. They're three phrases. And if you can catch this, it will save you the rest of your life. This is how important it is. Are you ready? Yes. Accent the good is number one. 
accent the good. Number two, punctuate the excellent. Some of you are like, I'm supposed to punctuate. <laughs> just, just Siri it real quick and be like, punctuate in your phone and it'll, it'll spell it for you. And the last one, dismiss the bad. We'll go one more time. Number one, accent the good. Number two, punctuate the excellent. Number three, dismiss the bad. Philippians 4.9 says this in the New King James Version, the things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. The Message Version says it like this, put into practice what you've learned from me, what you've heard and what you saw and what you've realized. Now, the beginning of a new season of life and the beginning of a new season of a, of a transition of whatever you're in, a new job, a new family, a new church, uh, a new year, whatever it might be, there are some, there's some interesting obstacles. How many of you know that you can't change what happened yesterday? Right. But how many of you, like me, focus on what happened yesterday and it ruins today? And then you focus on it tomorrow and it'll ruin tomorrow. And pretty soon we're focusing on things that happened five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. We're still focusing on those things that happened that were bad, that were real, but they are affecting our future. Yeah. And tonight I want to help us understand how to get rid of those things. Um, you know, if you operate a car without oil, without water, if you operate it in a place where um, without brake fluid, it, it, and maybe you're not, maybe you don't drive a car, you don't know the mechanics of it, but if you operate a car without oil, you will make it a couple blocks and it will start to overheat. It will, it will cause the motor to seize. It will, it will do things that, and the same thing with water. If you run it without water, it will cause friction and it will come to a place where your motor will blow up. If you, if you run your car without brake fluid, some of you don't use the brakes, but you need to. But if you have no brake fluid in your car and you try to stop, what's going to happen? You're going to crash. And these three life principles are going to help you understand that as you walk through life, there are certain things that need to happen for us to be in a place to win. Amen? All right, let's start with this. Accent the good. I want to back up one verse on Philippians. You read, we read 4 9. Let's read 4 8. Philippians 4 8 says this Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely and good, report if there is any virtue. And if there is any praise worthy, meditate on these things. The Amplified Version ends with the, it says this, fix your mind on them. Now, let me ask you this. What do you usually fix your mind on? The problem or the solution? What you, you, do, you, don't, have to, you don't have to say it out loud, but I, I, I usually focus on the problem. Because the solution always seems like too far away to get to. And the problem usually overwhelms me. But sometimes we have to change things. We are trained in our lives. We are trained to accent the negative or the bad. You can go to the store. And you can find a hundred things that you needed that day. The one thing that they're out of. Oh my gosh. Are you kidding me? They're out of butter. They're out of butter. You got a cart full of stuff, but you know what we focus on? The one thing we didn't get. Right. We always tend to accent the negative or the bad. And we have to learn to change our minds. I want to give you a quote. Listen to this. You will gravitate towards your most dominant thought. You will gravitate. You will do what you think about. It will go into your mind and eventually will go down into your heart and it will be who you will become. You will gravitate towards your most dominant thought. So my question is this, what are you putting into your minds every day? Now, I'm not a, a, an avid Walmart shopper, really not a shopper, unless it has to do with shoes. I buy a lot of shoes, but most of those you can buy online. But if you've ever gone and pushed a shopping cart, which speaking of shopping carts, 
Everybody understand that every shopping cart, I don't care which one I pick, always has a bad wheel. It never in it never fails. I look at all of them too. There could be a stack of them, and I'm like, I'm going for this one today. I pull it out. Are you kidding me? The one I get every time. Maybe it's not just me. Maybe it's you too. Or you get it and it's like, rrr, rrr, it's always full. I'm like, these things need new tires and front end alignments. I don't know what they do to those carts every day, but they need help. But as you're walking through the cart or walking through the, the shopping center, you begin to put things in your cart. Let me ask you this. If you were shopping, and somebody was walking behind you and you put some bread in there and somebody came to your cart and they just put a couple cans of soup in there. And then you're, you know, next aisle they put a, they put a, a couple cans of whatever, soda in your, in your, in, in your, in your cart. They put a couple, they put a couple pounds of hamburger meat in your cart and they start putting things in your cart. What would you accept that? Stuff you didn't want. They put diet products in my cart. I wouldn't want that. They put sugar free in. I would kick it out quick. I don't want that. They put they, they put they put fake stuff in there. I don't I don't want Splenda in my in my shopping cart. Get it out of there. Give me sugar. But when things start coming into our shopping cart, we start to we, we start to put in stuff we want, but more often than not. In life, we put in what other people are putting in our carts more than what we put in. We begin to put stuff in it, and in the natural, we would say, I would never let somebody, if somebody put something in your shopping cart, if you were shopping and somebody somebody got a, a I don't know, a big old thing of blueberry muffins, and they're walking and they're coming, they just set it in your cart, and you're standing there going, you would say, excuse me, uh, this isn't your cart. Can you get your muffins out of my cart? If somebody had a bunch of groceries in their hands and they're walking by and they see your cart and they go, and they dump it all in, you would say, no, 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 no. Uh, I'm not buying that. I don't want that. Get it out of my cart. In the natural, we don't have a problem taking stuff out. But in the subconscious and in the supernatural, we allow people to put stuff on us, to put stuff in us, and we just sit there and take it without standing up and saying, why am I not taking this out? Of my cart. If it's in your mind, it's only a matter of time before it will be in your heart and then an action in your life. The Bible just said, as we read in Philippians 4 8, to think on the things that are true. This is super hard, and I need you to get this tonight because. As we, as we pray over people and prophesy over people tonight, you need to understand this. What is true in your life? Now, we can make up a lot of stories. I'm a very good storyteller. My wife tells me that I exaggerate just a little bit. <laughs> because I can tell a story. My wife says, you know, if you ever lose your job as a preacher, you could always go sell used cars. <laughs> I said, thanks, I think. I don't know if that's a compliment or not. But sometimes I will exaggerate the story. And I tell people all the time, I, I, you know, um, I, I have a vivid imagination and, and sometimes I'll get carried away and they'll say, my, I'll, uh, after service, my wife will be like, uh, I don't know if that actually happened. I'm like, oh, it did. In my mind, it did. I saw it. <laughs> like I saw the story. And maybe you're not like that. Uh, my wife's a fact checker. You know, I will say things and she'll be like, you know, she'll be like, no, there was only three people there, not 300. I'm like, oh, really? I thought 300 people were there. <laughs> but we have to understand that there's a place where we have to focus on the things that are true, right. the things that are good, the things of virtue. If you're focusing on the things, if you're accenting the things in your life that are not true, and sometimes... Because we make it up, we believe it to be true. But if it, it hasn't happened, the Bible says to speak those things that are not as if they were. If you are speaking things that are evil on your life, the power of life and death is in your tongue. You are going to accent the bad in your life. Well, I bet I'm going to. I bet it's going to be a bad day today. Yeah, I've had a bad day in the last three days. I I can't stand my job. 
I hate, I hate my boss. I can't stand going to work. Listen, when you wake up every day and you say that, I promise you, you will have a bad day. Yeah, this is because you are accenting the bad in your life. You are accenting the negativity. When you get in your car, I hate this car. It always breaks. Guess what? It's always going to break. You're always going to hate your car. And if you don't hate your car, you would hate something else. Listen, I, you can give you the exact... Some people, no matter what happens, they're not happy. Go to the store. Can I? You're at a restaurant. Could I get a Coke? Sure, they bring a Coke. This doesn't taste like Coke. This is bad. Can I get a Dr. Pepper? And bring a Dr. Pepper. Is something wrong with your machine? It just doesn't taste right. And I said, hey, listen. Just drink. Man, this tastes good. This tastes like Coke. Now I understand if it's horrible. But sometimes we get so ingrained that thinking everything is wrong that we accent the bad every day and in our lives that we'll flip the script and begin to accent the good, God will begin to do something in our lives. There is a there, there was a, a story, it's somewhat of a joke. And uh, there's a little kids baseball team and they're playing playing ball and uh, they're in the they're in the top of the first inning. Any baseball players in here? Anybody watch baseball? The first inning is the very first part of the game, and the the, the little team is up, and, and and the dad comes to watch his son play, and the dad sees his son at third base, and they're they're out there, and the dad walks up to the fence, and he looks at the scoreboard, and it says fourteen to zero. His son is losing. And he says, he says, son, he says, yeah, dad, son's so happy on third base. He's smiling. He's so excited. And the dad's getting mad at him. Why aren't you mad that they're down 14 to zero? You should be upset. You're going to lose. He says, son, the kid looks at him and he says, yeah, dad, I'm in this game right now. Hold on. He says, son, look at me. He says, why are you smiling? He said, son, do you realize your team is down 14 to zero? He says, yeah, dad. You're losing. He said, I know, dad. He said, why are, you, why are you smiling? He said, oh, dad, we haven't got to bat yet. Now hear that little boy's thought. Most of us would say, game's over. We're down 14 to zero. You know, I'm a Laker fan, and I know that might be harsh on some of you. I was born and raised in Southern California. I'm a true fan. I live in Northern California now, and I'm hated because I don't like the Golden State Warriors. And if you're a Warrior fan, I'm so sorry, but I'm glad that they lost. It's because the favor of God is upon me. Hallelujah. And you know, my daughter, she has great faith. She believes like you know, the Lakers will be down by like 20 in the fourth quarter. And I'm like, this game's over. And she's like, what do you mean? They can make like 10 threes and win the game. I'm like, but that's very unlikely. And I start to speak negativity. I mean, I'm just like, turn the TV off. It's over. And the other night they were down by 25 points and they came back to win in that Golden State game. Now one, they got beat by 30 but the other one they came back and I and I turned the TV off and my daughter went in her room and we're both big Laker fans I just get stressed out and angry so I can't watch too much it's it's intense it's intense and she comes back out and she goes told you they could just hit a couple threes I'm like well they only down by like what 15 now she said no they're up by four they're gonna win this little boy was telling his dad, hey, listen, I'm not going to accent the bad. I may be down in the count. The scoreboard may not be in my favor, but my God hasn't even started yet. He hasn't even stepped in and done what he can do because he can turn it quick. And what that little boy was saying was that if they did it in their turn, we can do more with our turn. I'm not worried about how many runs they have. They should be how worried how many runs I'm going to have. And he began to tell his dad, don't worry about that stuff. Listen, in our lives, we have to accent the good. 
We have to punctuate the excellence. Listen, when you have a win, pay attention. Celebrate the victory. Celebrate the win. Some of you are like, we can have the greatest day. Well, it's probably going to be over tomorrow. Come on. Well, I don't know. Yeah, I got a job, but I don't know how long it's going to last. What in the world are you doing? Begin to punctuate the excellence when something is happening in your life. Declare it over your life. Thank you, Jesus, for everything that you've done. I'm declaring it tonight over my family, over generations to come. I am punctuating the excellence. The things that are happening in my life, I'm ready to do this. Yes, Lord. And the last thing is to dismiss the bad. We've got to get to a place. Now Vince Lombardi, one of the great coaches, once said, it's not how many times you get knocked down, it's how many times you get up. You're going to get knocked down in life. The Bible, Jesus says, if you love me, you'll be persecuted. That's not a, that's not a great scripture preached from evangelists or pastors around the world. It's not a great scripture to tell people, hey, listen, you're going to go through hard, hard times. When Paul's telling Timothy, hey, rejoice, rejoice in this. I've been ship, shipwrecked and beaten and thrown in jail and I've been handcuffed and, and torn and tattered. But get, get ready. Hey, we're blessed because we're still breathing. Some of us have trouble seeing that part of things. But we have to begin to dismiss the bad. And sometimes we have trouble dismissing the bad. You know, there is a, uh, there is a story about a, about a, sometimes in our lives, we focus on the bad so much that it not only affects us, it affects the people around us. Anybody ever heard the story of Chicken Little? Chicken Little? No, nobody's heard the story. The little, the little time, the, the, the kids, all the kids are like, I know it, you know. <laughs> Foxy Loxy and Turkey Lurkey and Lucy Lucy and all the people, right? Yeah. And all, all the all, and Chicken Little. Something something hits hits her head, and she says, "The sky is falling. The sky is falling." And she begins to run around. The sky is falling. The sky is falling. And guess what happens? Everybody around them, the sky is falling. They all go into panic. And, and I know it's a children's story, but it's really it's really what we look like in our lives. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. And then our friends are like, did you hear what happened to Susie? Oh my gosh, oh my gosh. And then somebody else, did you hear what happened? And then we put it on Facebook and, and, we, and we boost it and we pay money to tell people more people about it. We put it on all the social media sites and we say, oh my God, my life is over. And what really happened? This is a story says that Chicken Little was sitting under a tree and an acorn hit her on the head. And that one, one thing turned into a pandemic. That one thing turned into chaos. I've got to hustle here tonight because I want to get into a couple more things, but I want to tell you how to, how to do these things. Don't overlook the obvious in our lives. Take time to punctuate, to draw special attention to the excellent things in our lives. Punctuate your excellent family, even if you don't see it right now. Amen. The kids that might not be acting the way that you want them to act. Come on. Think about, I have kids. Some people can't. And I know we say this at the dinner table. When I was growing up, my, my parents had drove me nuts. I'm like, oh, I don't like this food. And you know, somebody in the third world country is starving right now. Just eat what's in front of you. You're blessed. And I'm like, I don't feel very blessed right now. These green peas and broccoli are nasty. I don't want to eat it. You know. And, and my mom and dad would encourage me. And they would encourage me sometimes with a strong hand or a belt. But they still encouraged me that I was blessed. And I had to understand that I had to punctuate the excellence. You need to punctuate the people in your life. Your family. Your job. Even if you got a... If you got a car that is broken down and busted down, but it's working, hey, punctuate the fact that it hasn't taken, it's not dead. There might be things in your life that's wrong, but punctuate the things that are right. Yes. Don't overlook the obvious in our lives. What's the obvious? Salvation, 
eternal life, God's promises, those are things that never change. No matter how bad the world gets, God's promises are yes and amen. They're always the same. Yeah. Here's the hardest thing to get through. Dismissing the bad. How do you dismiss bad? Well, there's two areas of bad. Now hear me. There is there's past bad and there's present bad. Listen to Philippians 3, 13 and 14. It says, brethren, I do not count myself as apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind me and reaching forward for the things which are ahead. I press towards the goal for the prize, for the upward call in Christ Jesus. What do we need to do to dismiss the past bad? Here's the hard thing. We have to forgive others. But more than that, we have to forgive ourselves. We hold ourselves hostage. I talked about this last night a little bit. We hold ourselves hostage over things that we can't, we can't change. We all have things in our lives that we've done that um, are embarrassing moments. That are moments where you go, oh my gosh, I cannot believe I did that. Um, you know, my, I love live stream and I hate live stream because there are things that I've done on live stream that I, everybody in, it's not in the world. This is an exaggeration, but it's something, if I do something the other day, I was leading worship and I was in the middle of a song and, you know, I lead worship and I preach. So sometimes while I'm leading worship, I start thinking about what I'm preaching. And I, I was leading worship and I forgot the words to the song. And I was leading and I was like, it sounded like I went like reggae all of a sudden. And everybody sent me a clip to my phone. And they're like, what exact language is this? What did you mean when you said this? Is this a prophetic word? And they thought it was so hilarious. But for me, I was like, I wanted to delete the live stream. And my wife, she said, we can't delete the live stream. So many people are watching it. They'll rewatch it and they need to see it. And I thought, how am I supposed to, how am I supposed to get through life? But I have to release the things of the past. I can't stay there. So you know what I had to do? I had to laugh with them. I had to watch it and, and get over my insecurities and go, you know what? If anybody else did that, I would laugh at them. So I need to be in it with them and say, you know what? It was funny. It was a moment. I'm not proud of it, but I can't stay there. I've got to move on and do the things. Now listen this. How do we reverse it? To dismiss past bad, to reverse it, to get rid of it. One, forgive yourself. Two, forgive others. And here's the big one. Don't rehearse it. Come on. Many times in our lives, hurt, pain, bitterness, unforgiveness, we rehearse. And this is the biggest issue of the whole message is this right here. You'll never be able to accent the good. You'll never be able to punctuate the excellent. You'll never be able to dismiss the bad if you cannot stop rehearsing the bad moments. Okay. Don't pick it back up. Okay. I grew up in um, Southern California in the mountains of Southern California. And I know you guys have rattlesnakes here. Um, we had a lot of rattlesnakes up where we lived. We lived on a 40 acre farm. That's what I was raised in. And we always had snakes. Our closest neighbor was about a mile and a half away. We lived out in the middle of the brush and um, we had snakes around our house all the time. Anybody here ever encountered a rattlesnake before? Y'all live out here in the desert. I, I would assume you've seen one or been around one. And um, you know, our dogs have all gotten bit and our heads got, you know, huge. And we wondered if they were gonna make it. And, now I live in California where dogs are actually people. And so you have to take care of them like they are people. But back when I was a kid, we were just like, well, let's pray he makes it till the morning. And that was how we took care of our dog that got hurt or got bit. And his face was big. We put some water by him and we try to make it. And one time, uh, my dad was, we, were, we raised pigs and there was a big, huge rattlesnake that was coiled up down by the pig pen. And my dad was going down to to uh, feed the pigs and this pig struck at him but it didn't hit him because the, the, the rattlesnake had a ground squirrel in its mouth so the tail of the ground squirrel hit my dad's leg instead of the rattlesnake's head 
And so the snake was there. It really couldn't do anything because it had engulfed half of a ground squirrel. And so what we did was we we held the rattlesnake's head with a with a shovel. We pulled out the ground squirrel and then we chopped its head off. And and as kids we would chop the head off and we would chop the rattler off and then we would all like shake it like hey, this is awesome. If you if you think I'm being cruel to animals, I'm so sorry. Sorry, people. I'll be gone next week. Hallelujah. But that's how we would handle the problem of a rattlesnake being around our house. We would kill it. But there was something interesting that even when we would kill the snake and we would chop off its head, my dad would always go and bury the head. Because if the dog were to get a hold of the head that was chopped off and dead, there was still venom in the head that could infect the dog. So he would bury the head so it would never be brought up again. Many times we have shattered something in our lives and we've cut it off and we said, I'm done with it. It's over. I don't want it anymore. And we've gotten healed from a situation in an area in our lives. And we've cut the head off of it. We say, I feel free. But let me tell you, there's still venom in that situation. And if you pick it back up, it is like going to pick up the head of the snake that's been cut off from the body. It can still come back and hurt you. Many times we bury something and five years, ten years down the road, we have a thought. You know what you're doing? You're digging it back up. And if you get too close to it and it gets on you again, You'll relive it, you'll rehearse it, and you'll be right back where you were. If you want to accent the good, punctuate the excellence, and dismiss the bad, yes. you have to be able to reverse it and never pick it back up. Never go back after it. There is something that's happened in, in, this, in this church with these people that are here tonight, with every person that's here. You can all think of a situation that you walked through and picked it back up. And some of you are still picking it back up today. It could have been with a mother, could have been with a father, it could have been with kids, it could have been a job, it could have been a career, it could have been a, a doctor's report. I've had people that I've seen healed from cancer, healed, prayed for them in the altar, got healed from cancer, went to the doctor, got declared, Yes, there's no more cancer in your body. We stood up on the platform, declared, yay, you're healed. You know what happened about uh, six months later? Oh, I know I got healed, but I just worried every day that it's going to come back. You're healed. Why are you even thinking about it? Well, I'm just worried that, you know, because they say that, like, once you have cancer, it can come back and come, come back. I said, no, you got healed. And you know what they did? They picked it back up. They picked it back up. Did you know that there's doctor's reports that God wants to heal you from, but he can't because you keep picking it back up? Come on. You stand in an altar and go, well, I came up for prayer tonight, but, you know, I haven't had a head. I had a migraines and I didn't have a headache, but I'm sure I'll have one tomorrow. Come on. We walk out of here and say, yes, I got healed. I feel so good tonight. But then we go home and we say, well, we'll see if it's still working in the morning. Listen, you are picking up venom. You are picking up the head of that snake and you're putting it right back on your body and you're wondering why you're dealing with the same thing that you've been dealing with for years. Tonight, we're going to break the curse. We're going to break that thing that has been held over you. There has been a season that you have walked through in this, in this family, in this house. If you're visiting, I don't know which ones are new. The good thing about me being here, I don't know if you're new or old or you've been here a long time. It doesn't matter. Who's here tonight is because God planned you to be here. And tonight there are things that need to be broken over your life that will never be picked back up again. There is a healing anointing in this house tonight. People are going to get radically healed and transformed. There are things happening even now. Y'all can play that good music again if you want. I always wonder why God has me preach certain things. Because he knows the end from the beginning. The Bible says that he's the author and finisher of our faith. Hallelujah. You know, if you're... I need to do something first. 
there is a there's a mighty move of the spirit that's going to happen tonight but before we do God told me during worship allow people to get right with me first God will only do what you allow him to do the Bible says that he stands at the door and he knocks he doesn't kick the door down he doesn't he doesn't hold you in a headlock he he's asking Will you let me in? Tonight, some of you in this room, you know God. But the question is, does God know you? Do you have a relationship with him? Or do you know him from a distance? You know, I know who the president of the United States is. His name's Joe Biden. I'm not gonna get into political debate tonight. I'm just telling you, I know who it is. Do you know who it is? You know who the president is, right? Does the president know you? No. Did you know some sometimes we can come to church and that's how we know God? But I want to get to a level tonight where I don't just know him from a story, I don't know him from a pulpit, I don't know him from a pastor or a preacher. I know him because I've encountered him. I've met him personally. Did you know that you can go to church your whole life and never go to heaven? Did you know that you can memorize every worship song? You can lift your hands. You can, you can pray. You can praise. You can clap. I tell people this at church all the time. Did you know that just because you go to McDonald's doesn't make you a Big Mac? Wouldn't that be weird? If you walked into McDonald's and you're like, I'm a Big Mac. But did you know that people walk into church and think that they're a Christian? Has nothing to do with walking in that door. It has everything to do with encountering the man named Jesus. And the, the worst thing I could do is to come here and to preach a word on how to dismiss the bad, on how to, how to accent the good, and how to live a good life, and how the power of God can do anything in your life, but never give you an opportunity to meet him for real. So for just a moment, all across the room, everybody in this room, just bow your heads and close your eyes. And I have a very serious question I need to ask you. And please don't answer it out of religion. Answer it honestly in your heart. There's nobody going to be looking around. I'm not going to call anybody up and embarrass you. I just need you to make a genuine call on your life tonight. Here's the question. If you die tonight, if you took your last breath, do you know where you would spend eternity? Hear me. Do you know for sure? This is not about... This is not about, well, I think I'm going to go. Grandma told me I'm saved. Grandpa told me. It's not about a generation who was saved. Are you saved? Because the Bible says in Romans 10, 9 and 10, that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, you will be saved. So the question tonight is very simple. If you did not wake up in the morning, do you know where you would end up? Tonight, before we go any further, that question has to be answered. And if you're sitting here and you go, Pastor, I think I'm going. No, there's no think I'm going. You don't get up there and it's not a gamble. You're not hoping to get in. You can have security tonight. And here's how. By one simple, sincere prayer that says, Jesus, come into my heart. Now, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to bring you up. One thing, with nobody looking around, on the count of three, I'm going to ask you to look up and make eye contact with me. And that's your way of saying, tonight, I say yes to Jesus. Again, I don't care if you've been in this church your whole life. If, you, if you've read every scripture in the Bible, that does not make you a Christian until you confess Jesus and believe in your heart. And so tonight, on the count of three, if that's you and you say, Pastor, I want to know for sure tonight. Look up and make eye contact. One, two, three. All across this room. Everybody looking up. Saying yes. Saying yes. 
saying yes. Everybody look up at me. Tonight, security in heaven. I ask God, why am I preaching this message, God? Because he wants you to learn how to accent the good. And this is the first night that you will begin to accent the good. That religion is no longer. A relationship is being formed tonight between you and God. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to pray together. I'm going to say it. Everybody in this room, if you looked up or you didn't look up, everybody in this room is going to say this prayer. Let's bow our heads one more time. Everybody say this prayer. Say, dear Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sin. Tonight, I confess you as my Lord and as my Savior. I give you my hopes. I give you my dreams. I give you my hurt. I give you my pain. And tonight, I thank you that I'm saved. In Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, let's put our hands together for Jesus. Never, ever, ever again do you have to wonder, where am I going? What am I doing? It's not about, well, did I make it to the altar? I tell people this all the time. If you don't know the day, this should be a bookmark in some of your lives that looked up. It was 8.30. Today, the 19th. On May 19th, 2023. Did I get the dates right? Yes. Yeah. Amen. As you get older, the time and dates fly by faster. I can never keep up. But if somebody asks you, do you remember the day you got saved? Yeah. Now listen, for those of you that looked up and met business, the next step for you and the next step for our leaders there needs to be a baptism. There needs to be a water baptism. And they'll lead you in that. I won't be here for that, but somebody will lead you in that. And that's the next step. It is time to raise up a generation of people that understand it's not about religion. Just because I come to church and sing a song and lift my hands, that doesn't mean nothing. People do that in worldly events. I lift my hands and yell and scream at Laker events. Ain't no God there. Well, he's with them now that they're winning, but not normally. And they're probably going to, well, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'm going to dismiss the bad. Jesus, help. You know, it's okay to come to church and have fun and celebrate life. Tonight, I want to pray declare the word of the Lord. Now, I never like to do anything without people understanding. I know this is a prophetic house. I I, I honor and respect the Harkies. They're prophetic, spiritual giants in the faith. Preach around the world. I don't know if you all know who stands in this house as pastor. I don't know what you actually, I don't know if you know what you sit under here at this house. But around the world, they are, they are gathering the multitudes. The other morning, just to brag on Prophet John, he texted me at about 6 o'clock in the morning. He said, Pastor Eric, God just woke me up. This is in a text. And he told me today there would be a lady coming to your church. She's Hispanic. She'll be dressed in a black shirt. This is pretty intense. He said, March 9th is the most crucial day in her life. He said, and she'll be restored in your altar today. Pay attention. I said, amen. I stood out in the parking lot, watched every lady come in. Like, I think she's Hispanic. She's wearing a black shirt. There's one, there's two, there's three. I'm sitting leading worship being like, I didn't care about anything else except what lady's wearing a black shirt. Okay, I think I've got all of them in my, I, I, I mean, I, the whole thing, I'm like, God spoke. He didn't have to think about me on a Sunday morning. He could have went and done his own thing, but he has the word of the Lord and boom. Right. So in our first service, I said, hey, before we, we, we had a couple songs, I said, before we go any further, the word of the Lord was, was spoken this morning by prophet John Harkey, and I'm going to release it here. I said it. 
four women came to the front. Who would have thought? They all came. Two of them were first time visitors. They were woken up that night by God that said that he was going to restore their marriage. Guess when their anniversaries were? March 9th. Brought them to the church. Now they're being restored that they're in marriage counseling. Amen. Working it out. That they're divorced. But believe that God can restore it. I'm telling you, the house that you sit in here is a house of truth. It is a house that is spirit-led. That is the power of the Holy Ghost flowing in this house. And I don't ever want you to diminish that I come to a church that might not have 100 or 400 people in it. That There's bigger churches in town. Yeah, there could be a big church with no power. There's churches that are a mile wide and an inch deep. And it's not about the number of people. If you'll understand the story of Gideon, Gideon had 32,000 people in his army, and God said, there's too many. He reduced it three times on it. If I was Gideon, I would have ran. He is facing an army of people, and he walks them all the way down to 300. 300 to go fight. And Gideon says, why are you doing this, God? He said, because then they'll know it's me. Come on. Right. Listen, when there's a revival that's birthed out of this church, it won't be because people are saying, oh, that's that real big church over there. Yeah, they always do stuff. And they'll say, whoa, that church over there has something happening over there because the, I've never seen anything like it. And those people over there are on fire. Listen, if you're visiting, I'm not trying to tell you to leave your church. If you have a good solid church and you're just here tonight to worship with believers, at our church, we do a Sunday night service. Most people don't have Sunday night services anymore. It's a thing of the past, old school. As you know, in our services on Sunday night, anywhere from 10 to 20 pastors around the city will come and be a part of that service. I have a pastor in the church that met with me, came to our men's gathering. We had Prophet David Fang at our men's gathering. And he's, he called me some pastor of this is such and such from this church. He said, I, I watch you online. I said, oh, amen. He said, yeah, I'm trying to figure out how to get my church to get into the Holy Spirit. I said, you, you have to figure out how to get your church into it? I said, just do it. Yeah, I, they'll kick me out. He said, but I want it. Would you mind if I came to your men's event, just sat in the back and just kind of just observed? Oh, he got blasted. I told David, I said, hey, see that guy back there? Get him. Go get him. Said, sir, sir, could you stand your feet? I said, yeah, get him. Get him. <laughs> the power of the Holy Ghost that changes lives. Tonight it's going to change yours. I, I'm going to, I'm going to go fast and hard. And listen, I, I like everybody to be understanding of what a prophetic word is. Now you hear it in this house a lot. And I believe that prophet John preaches it and understands it. And, and, and just to be clear, this isn't me just praying over you out of my flesh. This is a word from the Lord that I believe God's going to speak. And when he does, you have to understand what comes out of my mouth should be weighed by you. You should never trust man. Only trust God. Never said, well, that prophet told me, that evangelist told me. Then if God didn't tell you, then it doesn't matter. A prophetic word should exhort and should confirm. It should, it should motivate your spirit to say, man, that's awesome. It should resonate inside of you that goes, yeah, that's right. If a prophet is prophesying over you and you're like, man, this is horrible. I hate this. I don't want to be here right now. Just shut up already. Stop talking. If you're crying because you're like getting your feelings hurt, it's probably not a good prophetic word. You walk out of here and you're like, I have no idea what they were talking about. Like, it made no sense. They probably missed it. Now, is there things that God will say to encourage and inspire you that many times God will put something in us and we'll go, nah. Let me tell you what prophecy does. 
Prophecy allows God to. Let me back up. Prophecy allows you to do what you couldn't do before the word was released. I, I, I teach this everywhere I go, but I use you as an example. I don't know if you do or not, but you play the you play the instruments. Okay, good. You're a perfect example. So if I was if I was prophesying over him and I said, God is anointing you to play the keyboard. And immediately he goes, I don't play the keyboard. Well, a prophetic word releases an anointing that says God has anointed you to play the keyboard. You might not play it yet, but if you if you believe and, and 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 accept the prophetic word in a moment, it will allow you to do what you couldn't do before the word was released. So it empowers, it encourages, and it equips. And it should bring to you some sort of confirmation that goes, okay. Now he might not play the keyboard, but he might go, well, I like music. I think that's cool. I'd like to play an instrument, I just never could. I, I would like to play something, but I never have the time. Well, now he's saying, okay, God, you want me to play, what do we do? What do you gotta do first? You gotta get a keyboard. And you gotta turn it on. You gotta do something. You gotta get on YouTube or pay a teacher or, or get a book. You gotta do something. Right. Some people get a prophetic word, they're like, mm, just pick me up and take me there, God. Right. He's gonna move my foot. Oh, 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 he's gonna move my tongue. Oh, yes, he's gonna do it for me. God will never do what you can. He will only do what you can't. God's waiting on you. Prophetic words are to tell you that you can do it. The word that you got last night, you can go right back into where you were. Or you can say, I'm ready. I'm ready to do this. But now you have to start the plan, the action that says, how do I get to what God said? There's moments. And so tonight, God's here. His spirit is hovering and ready to settle upon you tonight. Father, tonight that you would move in power. Come, do what only you can do tonight. You could turn that music up just a little bit. This family back here in the back corner. Are y'all married? Have I met you guys before? Are you new here? You're new. You don't have to stand because it's so comfortable. What is your name? Ashley and and what? Edwin. And these are any more? Whoa. All right. Bless you. I see them all. Yeah. Let's count them out. Any more hiding under the benches we need to know about? Okay, this is it. There is a supernatural anointing upon your life, but it has been canceled through hurt and pain. You have an interesting story that you've walked out as a child. Somewhere in your teenage years, things all fell apart. It got real weird for you. And it, it really robbed your confidence and your security. It robbed who you were. And it was, it was a moment that you didn't know how to get through it. And you begin to reach into places that weren't you, but you didn't know how to do anything else. God was watching in those moments, and there is a, you're really a revivalist, and you don't know it. And I don't know if you know what that is, but you're truly a revivalist. You're, you're birthing a generation, but not just biologically, spiritually. There's something in you. You are a true speaker. You don't, you're no nonsense. You are like, enough. All you kids, you know. When she looks at you like, oh, mom's mad. Like, you know. It's in you. And it was because, I want to say around 13 to 15 years old, 
you made a choice in your life. You said, never again. And you built some walls around you that nobody would ever hurt you again. It's put you in a place of isolation. And how long have you all been married? 11 years. And, and I'm just telling you the word of the Lord. I think it's still hard for even him to get to places of your heart that you don't allow. It's just there. Don't mess with that part. Don't, don't do that. God's releasing you from some things that you've held on to and you've drunk. You were valid because it hurt you. But tonight, I'm going to come around here and I'm going to put my hand on your head. And when I do, I'm going to break a generational curse. It's not going to break it just over you, but it's going to break it over them. There is, there is some weird things that's happened in your family that's caused a, a splitting, a fragment, a hurt, a pain. And it's, it's interesting because family is the most important thing to you. But yet, to try to get everybody together is, is almost impossible. Because everybody has their issues. And that's everybody's family, by the way. We all got a little this in our function. But for you, it has hurt you here. And even when you see there's a certain person, I don't know who it is, but if I could say a name, you would cringe. And you see them. It's almost violent in you. It's rage. God's breaking some things tonight. He's breaking down some walls that have caused you to back up. And I don't know where you all call home as a church or who the family is. You know people here. It's time. The mending process is happening tonight. You get ready, we'll get to you in a second because you play a crucial part in this. <laughs> He's calling you to be 
you the priest of your home. He's calling you to stand up, to read the word, to teach these boys how to be godly men, to stand in the gap and to be somebody that never was for you. It was actually a, a, a gap in your life where there was nobody. You just, it's because you are slightly stubborn and can do whatever. You just decided to just go, just do it. You said, I'll go make money. I'll do whatever I have to do. And God says, now tonight, my hand is upon you. Favor is resting upon your life. Know that I'm God. You flirted with him a little bit, but now it's time to be in true relationship. Come all the way home. All the things you used to do, stop it. Tonight, start fresh. Watch what God does. He's healing your body. I don't know what happened. If there was an injury or something as a young boy. I don't know what happened. But God says he's healing your body. And I don't know if it's uh, neurological or if it's a blood thing or if it's bone. I don't know what it is. But God says I'm healing you from the top of your head to the soles of your feet. I'm healing your head. You'll never deal with that again in the name of Jesus. Be healed in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hey kids, God's real. Always remember this night. He's the real deal. Church doesn't got to be weird and boring. It should be exciting. Amen. Hallelujah. Will you stand with me? Yep, that's because he's going to heal you. That's why I made you stand. Can I get somebody to come stand behind her? Not that you're going anywhere, but if you decide to fly on the wall, I thought they'd catch you. What is your name? Have I met you before? You come here to church. You have before. But God told me to tell you that this is home. And I don't know where you go. I'm not trying to tell you to, to leave now, but this is going to be home or it is home. I'm not sure, but this is home. There is, the Bible says that the steps of the righteous are ordered. And it's almost like um, you've been stepping, I want to say tiptoeing, like trying to get into different places and see where, where is it comfortable. And I'm not just talking about church. I'm talking about life. God's bringing some new friends into your life. There's been a season of, of great loneliness. Are you married? Yeah. There's been a season where you have just been on your own. It's caused you great discomfort, even to the point of saying, I quit. And you've really just thrown up your hands. I see you just throwing up your hands, walking away and saying, I'm done. I can't do this anymore. I think those were your exact words. Actually, I can't do this anymore. And you found yourself in a place, uh, I won't say in a bathroom, maybe staring in a mirror and wondering how your life got to be where it is today. And there was many things that played into the role and some of it is your physical body, but a lot of it was just an attack of the enemy that brought a wedge. Here's what God's going to do. Oh my goodness. He's getting ready to rise you up. What's the physical problem? Is there a back issue? Right. Right. Was there an injury? Was there a... a no, it just, just started happening. It's going to heal us tonight. But more than that, he's your thought process. I, I preached this word for you tonight. You've been in a place where it's really hard to say good. You've seen a whole lot of bad. And you've been in a place where you say, I don't know how it's ever going to get better. But God says, tonight, my daughter, my hand is upon you. you have a sister? Does she live around here? Are you close to her? You were at one time. Yeah. 
God just shows me that that's the first relationship he's going to restore. He says he's bringing back to the thing that destroyed you. He's going back to the root. And he's changing it. He's rewriting the chapter. And tonight, he's healing your body. Isaiah 53, 5 says that by his stripes, you are healed. You've quoted it. Now, you're going to believe it. In the next couple of days, you're going to receive a phone call. And when it happens, get ready. God's coming upon you now. Fire! Now, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Ha ha. All those little boys back there just got their ears turned out like, whoa, what just happened? Made her baby jump. Amen. I'm sorry. Sometimes I just got to tell the devil he's not allowed it. So these boys are going to be like, this is the best church service ever. You ready? Dr drop the little one off to somebody. Come up here with me. I've prayed over you before. Yes. Yeah. Uh, there is a. Uh, bless me. I'm gonna do a little prophetic act and borrow this. So, if you can imagine. Last night we read about Elijah, Elijah and Elisha, and there was a cloak that looked something like this. Um, and it would have been worn as a symbol of a relationship, of authority, of anointing. And in that day, they, the tassels would represent things. It's also a place of a tabernacle that would come over and would pray. And the Bible says that as he was taken up in a whirlwind, as we read last night, that this thing came off of him and Elisha picked it up. Now, I'm not here to boast of what I do. I'm trying to get out of worship, so maybe I can give it all to you. I leave worship three times a week. I strum my guitar like a madman. I don't even know if it's actual strumming. I just play super on it. I play guitar like I preach. It's like <laughs> screamo Christian or something. I don't know. But God told me last night that there was going to be a transfer of anointing. And what he's going to do is in a moment, he's going to he's going to open up He's going to pour in a new anointing that's going to take you to another level. I, I told you last night that there's songwriting in you, and you flirted with it. You, 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 you sang some things and tried to rhyme and tried to do different things, and you're like, yeah, that's dumb. Nobody would like that song. And you try to sing it, and you're like, oh, that's awesome. And then you're like, eh. there's a prophetic song in you. I, I heard it a little bit tonight. But really, there's a boldness coming. Don't be shy. I don't care if you sing the wrong note. You say what's in you. And as you begin to say it, God will begin to use it. Now, I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to place this on you. You don't have to keep it. This might not. This is the other church, so I might get in trouble. Better regrace the live stream. Just borrowing it. Okay. No worries. I'm not stealing it. But just as a prophetic act, there has to be something of transfer. Now, there has been a confidence issue in you from a little child that has caused you to shrink back. Any type of opposition. 
somebody can say, I didn't like that song. Oh, I'm so sorry, I'll never sing it again. Somebody can say, I didn't, it didn't sound good. Oh my gosh, I just feel like I can talk about that anymore. Somebody can say, I, 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 I didn't like your outfit. And you'd be like, oh my God, I'm so ugly. I don't know what I did wrong. And it's like a little bit of opposition. But on the other hand, a little bit of encouragement makes you just want your gift, your, your spiritual gift is your, your receptive gift is words of affirmation. You you just just tell me I'm doing a good job and I'll keep doing it. And it's a it's a it's something in you where you you need that encouragement, but at the same time, when the wrong word comes at you, it just cracks you. And what's going to happen is that this transfer of anointing is going to give you a new boldness. It's going to thicken your skin just a little bit. Everybody that's in the arts and musical, we have really thin skin and we all wear our hearts on our sleeves. And people can just look at us wrong and be like, they hate me. Like, what makes you think that myself and they looked at me today? But that's not what happens. It's just the devil knows. He really messes with those that have an anointing. So tonight, there was a new song coming out of you. But God's not going to grab your tongue. He's not going to hold your arm and write the words. You have to do it. That means you have to find time to sit down. And that means somebody's going to have to take the kids for a little bit. Or you're going to have to go sit at Starbucks or somewhere. In the car. And you're going to have to just write. Put your phone on. Record. Sing. And it may come out totally wrong. And you're like, what does that mean? But it's time to step into it. Like I told you last night about the keyboard that has to happen. Okay? And then there's going to be opportunity for you. God is giving you, He's what He's doing is He's setting you up because there's going to be multiple streams of opportunity. He's going to begin to take you outside of these walls. This is training ground. But what's going to happen, he's going to put you, uh, you need to start thinking, uh, let's do a worship night in the park. Let's let's go to somewhere and set up and sing. Let's do something. You've already had ideas. It just hasn't been there. But God's going to set the place. And what he's doing here is building confidence so that your voice is going to ring out. The sound of your voice can never be stopped. God says, just let it go watch what I do. I'm setting you up into platforms that will take you to places. I'm not telling you that you're transitioning now, but I am telling you this. There will be a season when God moves you and your family into a whole new territory. He's called you to a place that's way bigger than you can see. You do this, plant your roots, grow, be groomed, Get to the place and train, and then God says, "What can I do?" So as I put this on you, as an evangelist, God, I declare tonight, in the name of Jesus, as I transfer an anointing, just as Elijah transferred to Elisha, God, I pray tonight that a supernatural manifestation of Your Spirit would come, fill her temple tonight, God. Father, I pray. Songs, prophetic songs, music, a supernatural anointing to play instruments like never before. An escalated rate, God, that it won't take years to learn, God. It will take weeks. God, that as she sits down with a desire, your Holy Spirit will come and operate through her. But even now, there's a new song in you. There's a song that you've written that you have, and it's kind of a go-to for you. You just kind of sing these little sentences. And God says, release it in Jesus' name. Yeah. His hand of favor is upon you. Hear me, it's going to move quickly. Stay humble, stay true, but be bold. Do it now in Jesus' name. I'm going to take the mantle back because I don't want it to be off of here. Well,
somebody else do this yeah. later? Yeah. Amen. The next uh, little worshiper there, come on up. I forgot your name. I'm so sorry. Anna Bella? Anna Bella. Little Miss Thang. <laughs> Is this one yours? How old are you? Eleven. There's a great confidence on you. I, I need to prophesy encouragement, but I also need to prophesy a warning. Okay? Sometimes our flesh gets in the way of our spirit. You have a great great talent and gift the ability to get up and sing at 11 years old and to do what you do is phenomenal but God doesn't want you to be a great 11 year old worship leader he wants you to be a successful 30 year old worship leader and what he's doing is you is training you equipping you and teaching you there is actually a supernatural gift in you in the arts. I know you sing, and I see you up there on the worship team, but there's some creativity. I see even some dance. Um, I don't know if, if, if you've ever seen like the, um, the, we have a hip hop dance team at our church, and it's, and it's the next level where they do their thing. Human video. Prophetic painting. I don't know if you are artistic in any way, but there is some level of creativity in your mind that you see things vividly. Did I pray over you last time? Did I pray over you last time? No. My goodness, you have you have an imagination that runs absolutely wild. Uh, you can have a full-on conversation with nobody. <laughs> That's just how you roll. So here's your real gift. You are that of a prophetess. You have the prophetic gifting upon you. That can be very, very great and very, very bad, depending on how you use it. Know this, bold warriors like yourself are, are prepped and primed for moments of great adversity. And God says, I'm putting a shield around you. I'm guarding your mind and your heart be very careful who you let into your circle. I know you're at a young age, but be careful of who you hang with. Be careful of who you sing with. Be careful of who you do life with. Even at a young age, God says, protect your mind, protect your heart. There's a fresh one blowing upon you. Again, God, double portion of your spirit. At 11 years old, God, let her stand for you and you alone. Let her worship you and let it be real. I don't want to give you a prophetic word. I want to give you a teaching. Look at me. We always do you. Don't, don't worship like anybody else. Don't sing like anybody else. Just be you. It's okay. I know they have all those Bethel and elevation and elevation rhythm and you watch all these cool people and you hear all these cool songs and you sing I thank God and you do all the runs that they do and you do all the little parts that they do but it's okay to just do it. My kids get so mad at me because we do songs and they say dad that's not how the song goes. I said well that's how it goes in my head. So that's how I sing it. And they get so mad at me. Be you. You have it in you. Sing the song. Watch what that does. Amen. Amen. Awesome. Come on. Your name? Come this way just a little. Don't want you to take out that expensive camera. Are we still online? You're watching it, aren't you? So let's keep an eye on us. We're like, if you're way over time. Is it already nine o'clock? Yeah. I'll go quickly. I can release everybody after this one, and then if you have to go, I understand, but if you want to stay and can pray for it, I'll stay as long as anybody wants to stay. But I understand some of you. I do need to pray over you 
in the back right there that made your baby jump. So you're not allowed to leave. <laughs> uh, but everybody else, if you want prayer tonight, I would love to pray for you. I just understand that it's Friday night, it's nine o'clock. So for some of you, that's super late. Bedtime was an hour ago. One more time, your name? Sounds cooler when you say it. What I say, Teresa? Okay, Teresa. My name is a big one now. You killed my father, Rivera. Right? I gotta get a better, I gotta get some better access. Hallelujah. I've been looking for the three day, my man. Six years, I'm sorry. I love, I love it. Hallelujah. When I go to the Mexican restaurants, I'm like, can I get a case of dinner? Just look at me, buddy. How old are you? Did I pray for you before? Is this about marriage? Did I pray for you about marriage? Are you married? What are you waiting on? <laughs> what in the world? Did you lose faith? You're not slow. You just got to have greater faith. I, I put my hand on your shoulder and God said, tell her again. There's a level of trust and uh, vulnerability that you are scared to death. I don't know if there was hurt in the past. There was something that just really just shook you. Were you almost married at one time? Were you in a relationship that you thought was the one? Yeah, that's going to get deleted. There's like a level of... And hear me, I'm not trying to put your stuff all over the internet, but I'm just telling you. Like, it's time to stop comparing of what was to what is. It's like you walk on a level and be like, well, it's kind of a downgrade, or I don't know, maybe I can't get that good, or maybe I'm not that good. And, and you're constantly comparing you to others. And then the devil has deceived your mind that you're not worth it. I break that off of you in Jesus name. God says I am sending you the one. I don't know what I said last time but there is family you're going to have kids. Maybe not as many as that girl back there but you're going to have lots of kids. I don't know, maybe you will. Maybe you'll beat her record. You planning on having more? No, that's a, that was a hard no. <laughs> All right, here's what we're going to do. You have been stranded in a place of isolation. And so tonight, prophetically, we're going to take one giant. Did I have you do this last time? No? Oh good, this is new. It's so weird when I pray over people that I prayed over before. I just feel like something is happening. It, you are you get really caught up in all the feels. I mean, you really get caught up in in a moment, good and bad. It is like it really just. I don't know if I should go or stop or you know run or walk or I and you just like. <sighs> You drive yourself nuts. You have a mind that never quits. It is constantly running as hard as it can to try to figure out a way. You are a formula-driven girl that just tries to figure out every possible way. You've already got it figured out. The problem with that is you forgot to include God. Because you know exactly what you want where he's going to be, how he's going to do it, and you've already figured it out. And if it ever comes any other way, you think it can't happen. And God says tonight, I'm shaking you from the core. I'm healing you of your past. What he's doing is he's not healing your heart. He's giving you a new one. Now, here's what we're going to do. Prophetically speaking, we're going to take one big step. And you're going to leave the old you behind. 
and you're going to step in to your call, your purpose, and your destiny. 28 years old. Elisha said to the Shunammite woman, I declare by this time next year, he said have a baby, but I'm going to say by this time next year, you will have met him, be in relationship with him. I better get invited back, Prophet John, by this time next year. Are you ready? No little step. You're not sticking one foot in and one foot out. You're leaving the past behind. Once and for all, it's going to break. One, two, three. Father, in the name of Jesus, I reverse the curse. I declare tonight, God, that everything the enemy has said to her, the lies, the tormenting spirits that have come, even in the late night hours that told her that she should just quit now. My goodness, there's been a spirit of death that has visited you that told you you're not worth it. Woo! It's leaving you now. I break it now. And I declare freedom. Your ears are being opened to hear the word of the Lord. There it comes. In Jesus' name. Father, I pray blessings upon our family tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. If you do have to go, I totally understand. If you want to stay, look at the kids. They're like, we got to We got to Can I borrow you? Anytime you won't hurt my feelings. If you do need to go, I totally get it. I'm going to pray for her, but since you came, I'm going to pray for you next. Okay? I got you next. How are you? Very pregnant. Are you, is this home for you? Is this church? Who do you, who do you know here? So all, so all the kids? Are you one of their kids too? Okay, good. Are you related? Do you not? Okay. All right. um, is there a husband involved man? for a moment. Do we know if it's a boy or a girl? It's a girl. Wondering. And it caused you to There's a mighty shaking coming to your family. And believe it or not, you're going to lead this mini revival in your household. There has been a family of chaos that has been absolutely out of control. And you were one of them. You just live for the day, live for the moment. And God says he's bringing order to the house. I don't know where you live or where that's at, but he's bringing order to the house. And out of this, he's healing the hurt and the pain. The baby is fine. 
this baby is going to have a great call of God on her life. She's going to serve God all the days of her life because you're here now. But there has been some, uh, you've been involved in some weird activity. Not, not just, not just normal stuff. You've been with a crowd of people that are dabbled in supernatural things that are not right. And God says that I am bringing you back to me. I'm calling you close. And God's going to hold you tight at night. There's going to be no more fear. There is a spirit of fear that has settled upon you that you're even wondering what's going to happen after the baby's born. How is this going to work out? You're even wondering things of like, are they going to take the baby? Am I going to be able to be a mom? How is this all going to work out? Where am I going to be? And God says that spirit of fear is released tonight. That I put it on you a new level of confidence and boldness. I'm healing you from the inside out. I'm healing that little baby. Its heart's going to beat strong. There's going to be no death. I reverse the curse tonight. And I declare healing. Yes. In Jesus name. Father I pray. That the trauma. I don't know if it was physical. Or emotional. I think it was both. But the trauma. That was encountered. Be erased from her mind. You're going to live a good life. You're going to be a testimony to those that are in your position. You're going to be hope to a generation that thought they couldn't. Tonight, know this. You're loved. We honor you tonight. We pray blessing over you and that little baby. In Jesus' name. Amen. It's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. I don't know where you go to church or if you go to church, but this church will help you all the way through. Okay? Awesome. All right, come on, little guy. You ran up here. You don't want to anymore? He don't want to. It's all right. It's all right. I understand. Come on. I've already prayed over you last night. I didn't remember. No double dip. All right. What is your name? Vanessa. You know people here? Are you family too? Someone somewhere along the way? This is your daughter. Have I prayed over you? What's your story? Are you married? Kids? Those are yours back there? Okay, I remember now. I've got you. has been that of a disrupted still place that is it's like after another fall it was so many you couldn't handle it. and God says that the rocks have stopped that the attack has ceased and God says I'm stepping in that no more, no more rocks will be thrown. But he wants to encourage you to stand strong because there are some ripple effects that have happened that you're going to have to withstand. But God says, be of good cheer because I've already overcome this situation. 
I've already gone before you and prepared the way. I don't know where you live, but God says, you, you have your, do you have your own place? You own your house? You're renting. Yeah, God's going to give you a house. God says that I'm preparing something for you out of your obedience. Now, there's a very strict formula to this. There's a mindset that you get into that really just takes you into a low place. I don't want to say depression, but sometimes you self-diagnose and even have, and have got a diagnosis that, hey, you're depressed or you're sad or you're, you're in this place. And you have right to be, but God says in this season, the joy of the Lord will be your strength. That I will take you and wake you. I will move you. I will show you. There's a supernatural level of security coming upon you. great family but really what you want is your family God says I'm getting ready to pour out blessings upon you if you'll trust me in this season watch what I do the joy of the Lord is your strength when you feel yourself going the wrong way it's time to declare the word this isn't the prophetic word but this is a Bible story David was in a place where he was so defeated and so lost. He had lost everything. Came from a place of his family being kidnapped. They lost the battle. He felt like he couldn't go anywhere. He felt like everything was gone. And he cried out and he ripped his clothes and he was, he was mad at God. And then he stopped. And he commanded his soul. He said, soul, bless the Lord. Soul, bless the Lord. You need to wake up in the morning and some days you're going to have to tell yourself, bless the Lord. We're not staying here any longer. Bless the Lord. You find yourself in places where you say, why? I didn't deserve this. God, you promised. And you, 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 you throw your hands up in the air and say, but why me? And God says, daughter, bless the Lord. My hand is upon you. My favor is moving. Tonight, be made whole. David that honors the presence of God more than anything. It was the children of Israel that tried to build a new cart to put the ark on to bring it into the city of David. And when Uzzah hit the, touched the ark, he, the Bible says that he died. And David immediately said, let's go back and put it to where it was. We need to do the right thing. And there has to be a moment where you understand that what God is doing in your life is that you've held true to the standard, to the conviction, to the moral capacity, even when those in your family have veered. 
But what happened was, is David got to usher in the presence of God into the city. Because of his faithfulness to stand true. Now, the story goes that he danced all the way down to his underwear. You don't have to do that. Hallelujah. There is an anointing up on you. You have a very strong prophetic gifting. You know the voice of God. You've heard it. You have conversation with it. There has been a leading in you of the last four to six months. Is this your church? Okay. There has been a leading and a drawing for you to uh, go to another level. But you also understand honor and you understand the process. You are never one to step out and say, watch me. But you do have some urgency in you of what's next. God is preparing you. I see, I don't know if they have an intercessor team here. You have a strong gifting of prayer upon you. You have a prophetic gifting upon you as well. That's why you're drawn to this house. But there, God is using you in the, I see you in the, in the marketplace and in the city. You said you do a little bit of everything, but I see you just not passing up opportunity, but wondering if it's really something you should do. And God says there's been some decisions that you have to make or that you've had to make that you're in kind of the balance. You're kind of waiting. And God says, I want to help you tonight and tell you that the answer is yes. You have been in, uh, you've been in kind of a, a limbo about a certain issue in your life. And God says, now is the time. There is some supernatural strategies. I see you just in the marketplace, just praying over people. And God's going to give you a boldness to step out and just lay hands upon the sick. I see you just seeing people in wheelchairs, even at, at, in restaurants and in grocery stores, of just praying over people. There's a boldness in you that has been, I think it might have been from a previous church or a pastor, caused you to really step back and wonder, oh, what's my place? Let me help you. Your place is on the front line. You are a warrior called for such a time as this. And God says, I'm preparing a way where there was no way. My Holy Spirit is hovering upon you and now is settling. There's a fresh fire coming. There's a wind of heaven that's falling. Fire fall even now. Come in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Okay, three boys right here. Come on. I'm telling you, they're never going to be the same after tonight. You want to come with them? No. Scared to death. Line this way. Look at me. Right here. Look at me. Nate? What's your name? Edwin. Isn't that your dad's name? Okay. EJ. Got it. Anthony. Mark. All right. What's his name? Ty. Ty. Guess what? J boy. Okay. All right. Got it. All right. Are you ready? Here's what's going to happen. I'm going to put my hand on who's oldest. And then you. Are you all in order for me? Okay. Perfect. We got this right. How old? 13? 10? 9 about to be 10. That's what comes after 9. Oh, three days. Come into your room, tell you to wake up. 
Does that make you mad in the morning? Like, I don't want to wake up. Go to school. No. No, we're going to do that. Well, the story goes that Saul had to go find his dad's donkeys. They had wandered off into the wilderness, and he had to go find them. While he was out finding the donkeys, he met a man named Samuel. 